Okay, we are live, and uh, welcome to today's program, and to the three that are there, welcome. Uh, today, I wanted to talk about uh, something I think is pretty important, <clears throat> and it's as old as uh, the fall itself uh, there in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve uh, sinned, um, but particularly Adam, uh, because Adam was the one who represented the human race. Um, we have been very good at making excuses and uh, now we have excuses for everything. And uh, people don't like to face the fact that um, we do things that are wrong because we ourselves are messed up people. We ourselves uh, have all these problems. We are um, inclined towards sin and foolishness and everything else like that. <clears throat> and so we do things that are very foolish. And I was thinking in particular, as I was uh, considering what to talk about in today's program, there's a bunch of email uh, that I, I need to get to. And people have emailed me some really good questions and some really good thoughts. And people have um, asked about different things. Um, people have listened to stuff I've done a while back. There was a good, real good question about eschatology that I'd like to get to. And uh, someone asked a question about the day, the day that we uh, worship um, on Sunday instead of Saturday, and why is that? And that's a question that, that comes up a lot. And there's also the issue of images of Jesus and the Jesus film, and there's a bunch of other emails, and I've gotten some other questions that are good, and I've got put those in my face-to-face -face folder under my email archive. But today I did want to talk about um, our excuse-driven culture uh, and how that affects even professing Christians at times. And it's, it's hard for us to admit that a lot of the things that we do, um, actually not a lot of them, all of them, um, are our fault. What we do, we are responsible for. Uh, the decisions that we make um, are our decisions. And while certainly we can be influenced by various factors um, in our upbringing and so, so on and so forth, at the end of the day, um, God uh, will not be accepting any excuses for sin that we've committed or anything else. And so we are the ones that are responsible. And I was uh, pulling up my sermon notes because uh, I did preach through Romans. And uh, I also pulled up um, uh, Douglas Moo's commentary on Romans, which uh, was a useful resource as I was preparing those sermons. And his comments on Romans 2.15 are, are important and uh, they're, they're useful. I wanted to read Romans 2.15 and you're hearing here. Uh, I'm actually back up to verse 14. For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, meaning... Um, even Gentiles that have no exposure to the Bible, they know that certain things are wrong. They know that it's wrong to kill people for no good reason. Uh, they know that it's wrong to commit adultery. They know that sexual sin is wrong. They know that stealing is wrong. Some of the big sins that are, that are plain and obvious sins, um, Gentiles instinctively, um, by nature, it says there, they, the, the fuse, the term fuse, um, instinctively do the things of the law. By nature, they understand the law. These not having the law, meaning the written commandments of God in the Old Testament, are a law to themselves. And he goes on, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts. So there's a sense in which every human being um, born and conceived in the world uh, from the time of Adam and Eve all the way down to right now has the work of God's law of, of what is right and wrong written in their hearts. And then the, the text goes on here uh, to say their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. And so our God-given conscience will, will always be doing one of those things, accusing <clears throat> or else excusing us, uh, accusing or defending us. And Paul speaks in other places. In fact, let me find it. Um, he speaks of, of having our consciences seared as with a branding iron. That's First Timothy 4, 2. It says, by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. If you have any real big scars on, on your body, you know that nerve endings don't work real well um, in areas where we have a real uh, deep um, or serious scars. You can't feel anything there. And that's why Paul says some people's consciences are seared as with a hot iron and they can't feel anything anymore um, uh, in terms of doing what's right or wrong. You, you'll, you'll have faint whispers that, that something's right or something's wrong occasionally, but people can have a conscience that is so um, demolished and so ruined by, by sin and by being burned over and over and over again that it just it ceases to feel anything at all. 
And so it's important that we, we recognize that law is written on the heart of all people everywhere. And people know that certain things are right, certain things are, are wrong. <clears throat> now, now, listen to uh, um, Moo, uh, Doug Moo's commentary here. He says, in saying that this work of the law has been written on their hearts, Paul might be alluding to the new covenant prophecy of Jeremiah 31, which promises that God will write his law on the hearts of his people. Now, I don't agree with that. He, he's saying some people might suggest that. Advocates of this view find uh, of this view that finds Gentile Christians in these verses naturally uses this as a support for their interpretation. But Jeremiah speaks about the laws being written on the heart and the complete knowledge of God that will result from it. Okay, so it's not talking about that. This is talking about in general, general revelation. Mankind knows through conscience that certain things are right, certain things are wrong. He a uh, moo continues here. Paul, however, makes reference to the work of the law being written on the heart and makes clear that this process still leaves the issue of final judgment in doubt. As Luther puts it, the knowledge of the work is written, that is, the law that is written in letters concerning the works that have to be done, but not the grace to fulfill this law. And, and Luther's right. Okay, the, the revelation of God's law in, na in nature through creation and through conscience is not salvific in any way because the law of God is always going to condemn us no matter what. Even as Christians, even those who are born again, regenerated by God's spirit, our obedience to the law still cannot in any way at all um, play a role in getting us into heaven at all uh, because it will always be stained with the remaining sin that's in us. Some of the results of the Gentiles' knowledge of God's demand are spelled out in the last part of the verse which says this, this is what I want to focus on in my first point in today's program, <clears throat> their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts, both accusing and excusing them. The word conscience comes from the Greek rather than from the biblical word. The word had an important technical role in Stoic philosophy, but Paul's conception does not go beyond the more popular usage. The conscience could be the source of moral norms, as in po our popular use of the term, but it is usually viewed as a reflexive mechanism by which people can measure their conformity to a norm. If then the law is that norm, the conscience of individual Gentiles reveals within each of them the extent to which that norm is being followed. Okay, and, and that's right. People's consciences are consistently bothered. That's why even you know, in almost all forms of paganism out there, you have the concept of, of a god or the gods are upset at us. Why? Because we, we're not good. We're bad. We do things that are evil. We know that. Uh, even ancient cultures th thought that you know, if, if we're bad, if we're naughty, if we're we lie, cheat, steal, murder, you know, then we're not going to have a good harvest, and the, the gods are going to get us for that. Okay, so conscience does show us uh, how well are you meeting the norm. Okay, <clears throat> if then the law is that norm, the conscience of individual Gentiles reveals within each of them the extent to which that norm is being followed. Paul uses bear witness. Okay, their, their thoughts bear witness of this process, and the meaning of conscience would imply that this witness is, first of all, to the individuals themselves. In light of verse 16, however, there may be a secondary reference to a witness before the heavenly judgment seat. The clause, their thoughts among themselves, both accusing or excusing them, might add a second independent idea to the witness of the conscience, but it probably expands it. The witness of the conscience consists in the mixed verdict of one's thoughts, accusing and excusing. Uh, you see that in, in like every video Ray Comfort's ever done with a non-believer. They, they will will admit, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I've told lies and I've I've lusted and but most of them, you know, he, he'll ask them straight up, have you, you know, pre premarital sex? Yes. And have you done this? Have you done that? Yes, yes, yes. <clears throat> and, but at the same time, their conscience also excuses them. Well, I'm not as bad as I could be. I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm not as bad as some people I've heard of and that sort of thing. But listen to, uh, Moo continues on here. This debate among the thoughts goes on constantly, but its ultimate significance will be revealed in the last judgment as verse 16 shows, which verse 16 uh, specifically references um, the final judgment. Listen to, uh, let me read verse 15 and 16 together. Who show the Gentiles who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Okay, now Moo continues here. The excusing and accusing testimony of the thoughts within each person's conscience portends the verdict of the one who will bring every thought to light. 
Some have seized on the reference to excusing as evidence that this final verdict could bring salvation to some Gentiles apart from the gospel. Obviously, that's grossly wrong, as Moo points out. But this misses the connection in which the idea stands. Bengal is on mark, quote, the concessive particle even shows that the thoughts have far more to accuse than defend, and the defense itself does not extend to the whole, but only to a part of the conduct. And this very part, in turn, proves us to be debtors as to the whole. Okay, now, the reason I wanted to go through some of that here is um, the consciences of men, okay, apart from a divine work of the Holy Spirit, the consciences of men are going to be a mixed bag of accusing and defending or accusing and excusing uh, our consciences before we're born again. Well, yeah, I'm not, I'm, yeah, I do things that are wrong and I'm sinful and that, that's the, the, the work of the laws and their hearts. We know we fall short of it, but the, that conscience will also, the, the thoughts of someone will also say, well, but I mean, if, if everybody that, that's ever lied is going to hell, I guess we're all going to hell. And, and, I'm not that bad, so that the thoughts excuse as well. Now, I'd like to suggest that in our time, especially today in America, it seems that the thoughts of unbelievers are almost exclusively excusing them. Like there's almost nothing accusing at all. It's even the worst things that, that a person does, even the, the most vile, perverted, twisted things anyone ever does, they're not sin. And they're justified in that way, and, and everything's fine. And anything I do wrong is someone else's fault. It has to do with nurture. It has to do with the way I was raised. It has to do with someone else is responsible for doing something to me that caused me to make really bad, sinful, foolish decisions. And the thing about Scripture, the thing that God really impressed on me when I was 18 years old, is there's no excuses that will work with God. There are no excuses that will work with God. That's why verse 16 is so frightening. Verse 16 was used by God early in my Christian life to really rid me of this, of the excusing part. In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel, I thought, God knows my secrets. He knows and can see plainly everything that's ever played out in my mind, ever, every motive I have ever had, every thought I've ever had. He knows all of that. He knows my secrets. Yep, I'm going to hell. Not a doubt about it. And that was one of the things God used to show me, you need Christ. You need to be dressed in someone else's righteousness because you are so evil and so bad. And it's no one's fault but yours. And all the decisions you made, it's not anyone else's fault. Have I been sinned against in my life? Yes. Yes. But what about all the things that I've done in my life? That's the main thing. That was one of the marks. That, that is one of the marks of conversion, I believe. You stop playing the victim card all the time, and you actually start thinking about something that before was just unknown to you. And that's this. Much more important than the ways that I've been a victim of other people is all the people who have been victims of me. All the people I have sinned against. And that was a big shift. I remember that and, and thinking that's one of the reasons I think I was converted when I was 18 and, and not before that. I quit caring about what I felt people had done to me or my parents or, or anybody had done to me. I just didn't care anymore. And then it, it, all I thought about was all the people I had wronged, all the people I had sinned against and wrote a lot of letters, wrote, wrote letters to people, reached out to some people from my past and asked their, their forgiveness. Some Some mocked me. Others were thankful for it. That was a real change. That was a real change because I recognized the main problem I have is not what people have done to me. It's what I've done against others, and it's what I've done against God because there's no excuses. No excuses will work with God. Nothing works with God. And that's what Romans 3.19 is talking about. You know, Romans 3.19. And I sprained my wrist the other day. I, I don't even remember doing it. My wrist hurts so bad today. Oh, Romans 3, 19. We know that whatever the law says, and it's hard to even type, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Whew. Okay? Every mouth will be stopped. So the secularists and the liberals and all these 
whack jobs today that have constructed the tower of psycho babble and think that every dumb thing they've ever done is someone else's fault. Sorry, your mouth's going to be held shut by the divine hand on the day of judgment. You know, you think of the, the last verse of, um, I think it's or is it the last verse of Romans 1. Um, no, I'm sorry. It's not without excuse. It's, it's earlier in Romans 1. Yeah, Romans 1 20. Even they see God in creation, they see his handiwork and they see his invisible attributes, his uh, that term uh, translated Godhead there, his theatetas, his divine nature. You see the glory, the wisdom, the power of God in creation, such that we are without excuse. On apologetus, on apologetus, alpha privative apologetic. You are without an excuse, without a defense. There is no defense for anything we have done that is a violation of God's law. We're all guilty because of what we choose to do, and we can't point a finger at the woman you gave to be with me. I think Adam practically makes a double accusation when he says that. He he said, Adam, or God's like, what have you done? Have you eaten from the tree I told you not to eat from? What does Adam say? The woman, so there's the first accusation, you gave me. <laughs> He's trying to blame God. Aren't we thankful Pete, nobody does that anymore? <laughs> the woman you gave me. It's God's fault. God put me in this situation. I can't help it. I said I, I can't help it. Nope. Without an excuse. Adam had no excuse. God turns to the, to the woman. What is this you have done? What does she do? The serpent. He made the devil. The devil made me do it. So, it, I mean, nothing's changed. So, there you have man... Um, why are you so bad and evil? The woman, the woman you created. It's it's someone else and God. It's your fault that I've done all this stuff. Or the devil made me do it. When are people going to learn in our society and culture? When you sin, when you do things that are foolish, when you ruin your own life by decisions you make, it ain't nobody's fault but yours. Every sin I've ever committed in my life is my fault. Every decision I've ever made. No matter how others may have influenced it, still my decision. It's still something I did. Isn't that so irrational and weird? Somehow, what what I did, uh, someone else's, it's their, it's their fault. God didn't make Adam rebel. Eve didn't make Adam rebel. What's he talking about? The woman you gave me. What he should have said was, I did it because I'm stupid and because I wanted to do what was evil. I wanted to rebel. I wanted to do what was wrong and I have no excuse. I make no excuse for it. Yeah. I just rebelled because I'm wicked and evil. I'm bad. Why do we do things that are foolish? Cause we're bad people. People don't like that. They don't like to be told that they're bad. I'll tell you, you know, I've said this many times um, to folks when I do pre-marriage counseling and I, when I preached on marriage, I thought I was a nice guy until I got married. I did. I thought I was. I thought I was a real catch <laughs> until I got married. I thought I was a really nice person until I got married, and then I realized, no, you're not, man. You're capable of being real selfish. Why? What? But but why? Why would I be so selfish? Because I'm a selfish person. I'm a bad person. I'm an evil person. I'm very thankful. That, that God changed that mentality, the victim mentality to realize, no, 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 you're not a victim, Patrick. You're a perpetrator. It, it never ceases to amaze me. You know, the atheists and the unbelievers, you know, how can you believe in a God that of, of all goodness and mercy and tenderness and kindness? Look at the world we live in. This world's a disaster, all the pain and suffering and injustice and everything else. And, you know, why why was would God allow this? Um, uh, because he lets us live here. The, the perpetrators of sorrow and evil and injustice cry out against the holy God as if it's his fault that the world's full of injustice and pain and, and suffering and torture and madness and idolatry. It's not God's fault. God's holy. This world is constantly burning and set on fire because we live here. Because I'm alive. I remember years ago, Walter Martin, his theology was was not, you know, was not that great. He was very good on, on cults and like some of the core Christian doctrines and issues. But I remember him making a really, really important statement. And it was a very true statement um, talking about um, 
evil in the world, the problem of evil. And uh, Walter Martin, um, he was trained in philosophy. That was what his his uh, educational background. He was trained in, in uh, philosophy, the history of philosophy. Even though he was a real opponent of philosophy and thought it was you know doodlers with with words who constantly wasted people's time. But he was on a talk show, and one of the the statements that kept coming up is, you know, why would God allow all this evil? And how dare you know the, these these perpetrators of evil who commit all the evil? How can God let all this evil happen in the world and everything else? And Walter Martin hearkened back to what something Aristotle said, <laughs> because this this atheist was saying that if God was really good, he would annihilate evil. He would annihilate evil. And Martin appealed back to a distinction, a true distinction that Aristotle made. To truly annihilate something, you have to annihilate it at, as both an actual manifestation and as a potential manifestation. That would mean anything that has the potential of being evil. If you're going to annihilate evil, you have to annihilate all potential for evil. So if God's going to get rid of evil, what has to disappear? What has to be annihilated? We do. Why? If God is so good, why doesn't he annihilate evil? That's like saying, if God's so good, he should kill me. Well, that's certainly true. And the thing is, one way or the other, our sins all will be dealt with and punished by God. One way or the other, in this life or the next, uh, at the cross of Christ, uh, or being cast into hell. But I'll tell you, this millennial group, um, they need to stop spending all their waking moments thinking about why it's someone else's fault that they're a mess. And realize that if you make lots of really foolish decisions and sinful decisions, it's no one's fault but yours. Okay? It's the strangest thing. Their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. Millennials don't have very many thoughts that accuse themselves of anything. Everything is an excuse. Their thoughts are always excusing every foolish thing they do. And that's why I pray every Sunday in my pastoral prayer and pray in my personal life. When I pray to God every day. When I pray the, the petition, thy kingdom come, and I pray that God would convict the world of sin. If he doesn't do that, none of our evangelism is going gonna, is gonna to work. There's no fertile soil for the gospel seeds to grow in. If God does not convict people of sin, forget it. Forget it. Um, evangelism is not going to work. Okay. <sighs> so there's, there's the first part of today's program. Uh, let's see. Um, 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 um. Let me go to my face-to-face -face folder here where I've got some emails from folks. And uh, I'd like to get these in, in order if I could. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, Blake B. Uh, is a fellow I've corresponded with before. He asked a good question here. He asked about Lordship Salvation. Um, he said, um, in an upcoming face-to-face, -face, the subject of Lordship Salvation, the proper understanding and incorrect versions of the idea. It seems like there are numerous ideas that all take the title Lordship Salvation, and some of them are clearly not reformed. These um, uh, things like making a decision for Jesus, but at the same time, if Lordship Salvation means Jesus is your Lord and Master and you seek to obey him, I don't see how that's not an accurate position. I noticed Theocast recently is doing a series against Lordship Salvation, but how are we defining it? If they mean Federal Vision or John Piper, Justification by Faith and Final Salvation by Works, then I agree, that's trash. If Lordship Salvation means that a true Christian is changed, bears fruit, and seeks to obey God. Well, that's just biblical. And how could someone disagree with that? <clears throat> I think that's very well stated uh, and right on the money. Um, I have uh, Zane Hodge's book absolutely free, and I've, I've not read the whole thing, um, but what I have read in it is pretty bad, and it, it shows that you need to be reformed in your theology uh, to understand the gospel correctly. Because if you're not reformed, if you if you really are semi-Pelagian or Pelagian, and you think man has this inherent ability to convert himself, well, then of course you're going to think that discipleship and following Jesus, that's every bit, that's as, just as much up to your free will as becoming a Christian was. As a reformed Christian, meaning someone who believes the Bible, what it says about salvation, God has an elect people. They have been predestined to uh, be justified, to be effectually called and justified, that, that gives them a legal, t legal title to get into heaven. They also have been predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ, and God changes them. I, I covered this, actually, um, in a sermon I just preached on James chapter 2. Again, it's a, a chapter I, I go to um, usually once every couple of years because it's a chapter that comes up a lot. It's very important to the day and age that we live in, especially living in the Bible Belt. But Titus chapter 2 uh, speaks of Jesus 
in his redemptive work, um, re redeeming us from all of our sins and also purifying for himself his own special people who are zealous for good works. You cannot have one without the other. Okay. Every person that Jesus died for to redeem. Um, let's see. Let me, let me find the passage uh, in Titus chapter uh, two. Is it two or three? I can't remember. Let me find it here. I love good Bible. Uh, Titus two. Yeah. Speaking of, of Christ, <clears throat> looking for the verse 13, Titus two 13, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself in our behalf. There you have the, the phrase uh, who pair a moan, a very, the substitutionary language who gave himself in our behalf that he would redeem us from every lawless deed. Okay. So there's justification. That's how we get into heaven. And that is the only way we get into heaven. And the passage goes on and purify for himself, his own special people, zealous for good works. You want to understand, you know, so-called quote unquote lordship salvation. You understand, want to understand this correctly by the redemptive work of Jesus at the cross, we're redeemed from every lawless deed and we have a legal title to go to heaven and God and every person that he redeems like that. He purifies for himself, his own special people, zealous for good works, a redeemed person um, who's not zealous for good works, non-category in scripture doesn't exist anywhere. Now, recognizing that God purifies for himself his own special people zealous for good works is a far cry from saying we get into heaven by those good works. That's real different from saying we're finally saved by those good works. It's real different from recognizing that every person that is justified and declared righteous and given a legal title to go to heaven and to get past the final judgment of God into heaven by the blood and righteousness of Christ alone has also been born again and is no longer the slave of sin. And while they will struggle mightily with sin in this life, they nevertheless will have some degree of sanctification in their life and they will have a zeal for good works and, and they will follow Christ. Recognizing that um, faith in Jesus Christ is always accompanied by a changed life and by good works is not the same as saying that we're justified or get into heaven by faith and good works. Okay. It's real simple. It's real simple. What gets us into heaven? The atoning work of Christ and his imputed righteousness. That's it. It is the person and the work of Christ that him fulfilling the, the two facets that we need fulfilled, the curse of our disobedience, that's got to be paid for by a substitutionary death. That's what the cross is. But there's also the positive existence of perfect righteous obedience to the law. That's what Jesus achieves in being born under the law and living in perfect conformity to its every demand and, and not, not transgressing everything it forbids. He produces that and gives that righteousness to us by imputation. Uh, and our sins are not counted against us because they're counted against him because he gave himself in our behalf at the cross, that he would redeem us from every lawless deed, justification, and purify for himself his own special people's zealous for good works. So a Christian who's not a disciple of Christ is a non-category. But that doesn't mean you get into heaven by being a disciple of Christ. No. Or that's not saying you get into heaven by, by the fruit the Spirit bears in your life because it functions as an open confirmation of the reality of your faith. Why would God need that? He already knows where your faith came from. If he granted faith to you, if he's the one who granted to you to believe in Christ, why would he need an open confirmation of that on the day of judgment? He doesn't. He doesn't. The judgment of works is for rewards, not salvation from sin, not getting into heaven, not being welcomed into heaven or any, any of these other wonderful, fun, nuanced ways that people are trying to slide works back into the gospel. So that's what we're talking about. Every person redeemed from their lawless deeds, Titus 2, 14, God also purifies and makes zealous for good works. We're not saved by those good works. We're not welcomed into heaven by those good works. Those good works do not function in some kind of eschatological vindication of our faith or anything. There's nothing in scripture to support that either. There's no such doctrine as final salvation by fruit. That's not taught anywhere in the Bible, anywhere at all. So hopefully that, that helps uh, as far as that goes, the lordship salvation question. I actually, I thought I wrote in the title here, uh, something else. Hey, there's art. Um, hope you guys are enjoying North Carolina. Um, my boy, my, my one of my uh, older boys has got a jujitsu tournament coming up, uh, this weekend. Uh, so we'll be in um, a part of North Carolina for that and hoping that, um, he doesn't get hurt or killed or hurt or kill someone else. Uh, he's quite the beast. Um, so I'm excited for that. Paul, my son, Paul's going to be doing the jujitsu tournament. Uh, let's see. I don't see the title I gave to this video. Okay. I don't remember what, what else. All right. Let me get back to the face-to-face uh, -face folder here. 
Um, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, there's the uh, yeah the Castlemans. They're, they're a sweet family. Um, that sends stuff once in a while. Okay, uh, I, th- I thought I already answered that one. <clears throat> okay, yeah, yeah. Here, here we go. Free offer of the gospel. This this actually was a, a, an issue that came up um, in my two two denominations ago when I was in the BPC. The um, the Book of Church Order in the BPC was modified to have a little clause about we believe in the free offer of the gospel. This is a very good email. I wanted to read this and um and a comment on it because this is an important question because people think that. That, look, if you're Reformed, if you're a Calvinist, if you believe that God has an elect people, he's chosen them before the foundation of the world, are we are we really being truthful to tell people, if you repent and believe of the gospel, uh, you'll go to heaven, no matter who they are, whether they're elect or not elect? Um, is it okay? Is, there, is it a genuine offer? Is it a genuine offer of the gospel? Okay, so th- there's actually, a, I think, a fairly easy response to this question, but this is, uh, this email is very well written. I wanted to read it to you. <clears throat> okay. Is the free offer of the gospel sincere in some sense and that God loves or finds favor, hopes they choose or desires their salvation when the gospel is preached to the non-elect? If you have covered this in one of your videos, please direct me. I, I don't, I don't recall ever covering it. The reason I ask is I've been taught the Reformed teachings, mainly through pastors, theologians who are from Westminster, Philadelphia. As you know, John Murray wrote an essay stating that by common grace, the gospel is genuinely offered to the non-elect since he finds favor toward them. I think Murray is wrong about that. Um, and I think it's a mixing of categories. Uh, and I'll explain what I what I mean by that in just, just a moment. To me, this is Arminianism and Universalism, since for it to be logically valid, then the non-elect had Jesus die for them, too, and they have the ability to choose him. Yeah, that is that is something that you have to wonder. Uh, in what sense is it is it genuine? I mean, if you're going to say God, God is actually offering to the non-elect um, salvation in Christ, I mean, I don't agree with that. He clearly is not doing that. Um, to me, that's like saying that God God genuinely offered to the, to the Egyptians to... Um, to repent and come to know him. Um, God judged Egypt and its gods. He, he, they were raised up for that purpose, to be destroyed, to manifest his glory. There was no free offer. That's another thing, like the whole provisionist perspective. <laughs> um, those guys, uh, Drew McLeod, and uh, I can't recall the other fellow's name, uh, that John or Wark and I debated over, uh, does God have an immutable pre-creation decree? They talk about God having a provision for every man, woman, and child in the, the whole world. I'm thinking, well, what was God's provision for the um, the Canaanites that were wiped out? Every man, woman, and child, everything that breathes was was killed by Joshua and the armies of Israel. What was the provision God made for them? Or how about the armies of Egypt that were buried in the Red Sea? What well, what provision did God make for them? It's absurd. It's just absurd. And they don't like the idea that God has the right. He has the right to condemn and discard the entire human race and to send the whole race of man into hell on account of their sins. People don't like that idea, but once again, we have to learn, especially today in America, because we don't like something doesn't make it untrue. What what I do or don't like has nothing to do with what's true. It's like when Greg Bonson debated Eddie Tabish. Um, Bonson said, my opponent has basically stood up here and said, what I don't like doesn't exist. And Bonson said, that's pretty childish, isn't it? That's like the, the child that goes to bed at night, uh, because at a certain time he doesn't want to, because his father makes him go to bed and he pulls the covers over his head and says, well, dad, you don't exist because I don't like you. I think, wow. People, people really think that way. If I don't like something, it's, it's not real. Okay. That's irrational and crazy, but people... In our culture today, our um, irration, irrationality and insanity are, are a way of life in America today. Okay. <clears throat> but most importantly, Scripture says that God hates the non-elect and has fitted them for destruction as vessels of wrath. That's right. Romans chapter 9. Romans 9. John Calvin has said that God is fattening them for slaughter for the day of his wrath. That is exactly right. He is. My point is not to denigrate the non-elect or John Murray. He has written some very good articles. Yeah, Murray's book, Redemption Accomplished and Applied, was um, one of the first reform books I ever read. I learned a ton from that book. Uh, he goes through each of the you know doctrines in the Ordo Salutis there. And uh, you know, I remember sitting in the stands when I worked at Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company as a computer contractor. At, during, at lunchtime, I would go to the – they had a gym there, and there were guys that would play basketball, and I would sit up in the bleachers with Murray – uh, and my my Bible, and would look up the references and and read them. I learned a ton from that book. So yeah, Murray is Murray's not all bad. Um, 
Okay. Oh, let's see. But to clarify this concept of common grace, which pervades Westminster's teaching, yeah, yeah, I think this and the mono covenantalism. Um, yep, yeah, that's what um, this fellow had asked about grace. You know, are are God's interactions with Adam before the fall based on grace? No, they're not, because there's no need for grace yet. And to say that they are uh, creates um, very serious problems. And that's why I gave all the quotations from uh, Meredith Klein and that uh, Robert Raymond uses. Because Klein Klein was exactly. Correct. And he described, particularly Daniel Fuller's theology, who was John Piper's hero, um, as an error of monumental proportions, of, of massive proportions. Okay. I think this and the monocomanentalism has created ambiguity in the true gospel since it focuses on God's love instead of his justification towards sinners. It also seems to be trying to homogenize Arminianism, Calvinism, Rome. Van Til would say this is a paradox, but I don't see it that way as explained in scripture. Also, one of the key uh, debates in the Van Tilian clark controversy was over this issue. Clark said God showed no favor or love toward the non-elect, while Murray says he does. Some say this was actually the key point in the debate. Uh, yeah, there is a general benevolence uh, in that, you know, it's not like uh, it never... I mean, the Egyptians had a pretty posh life. I mean, they had a river that that supplied them with, with water and, and gave them in its annual flood, usually uh, some of the richest and most fertile farmland in the world. Was, Egypt was a land of plenty. They had gold and, you know, they had all this free time and they had plenty to eat um, and everything else. So there's, there's general benevolence. I don't like the phrase common grace because it's a category confusion. Okay. It's patience. God, God illustrates and demonstrates patience towards those that are prepared for destruction. Um, and he shows a, a general benevolence. I mean, it rains upon the just and the unjust. I mean, uh, <clears throat> a, a, a reprobate person who will always hate God can watch. I mean, could look out my window and see the beautiful fall colors. I mean, I'm telling you, the fall colors and and where I live in the Appalachian Mountains, in Northeast Tennessee, have been absolutely stunning. I think they've been the prettiest and most bright red and yellow uh, colors, and every every shade in between. I have ever seen in my life when we went to doe river gorge for the creation conference a couple weekends ago i mean the, the sun came out for a little window of time it was absolutely breathtaking how beautiful it was it was so beautiful to see those colors and to see the contrast and the the blue and the white clouds and the and the beautiful rocks and everything you think you know god is a god of wonders truly and a non-christian could look at that and and enjoy that and and even see the handiwork of god in it in, in some sense that doesn't mean that God is giving them grace. Rather, he's showing patience towards them, and there's a general benevolence and that God God does good. He God does good to the sons of men. His tender mercies are over all his works, including um, non-Christians. Okay, although mercies is, is too strong of a word. Um, but they they eat good food and have kids that that you know survive birth and don't have birth defects, and they, they have a lot that they should thank God and glorify him for, but they don't. Okay. Uh, let's continue on here. Now, obviously, we don't know who the non-elect are. Now, that's, to me, that's the key issue. That's the key issue. If people want to ask, well, is it is it a genuine offer from God? Okay, listen to me, please. God is not the one preaching the gospel. God is not the one out there doing it. Now, when God in human flesh walked among us, Jesus Christ, you know what he often did? He often told people why they didn't believe in him. In John chapter 10, Verse 26, he says, you don't believe because you're not of my sheep. Why, how did he know that? Because he's, he's God. Can we ever say that? No, because we don't know who the elect are. We have no idea who they are. So I can never say, well, you don't believe this crowd here that I'm preaching to. You don't believe because you're not of the sheep of Christ. I can't say that because I'm not all knowing. Okay. People want to ask, well, is, it, is it a genuine offer from God? God is not the one out there preaching the gospel. God is not the one out on the streets telling people about Christ. Okay, so it's really, um, it's a moot point. Is it, is it um, a sincere offer from God? God's not the one out there doing it. What we do is not, is not tell people, God loves you, Jesus died for you, give them a chance. We call people to repent and believe in Christ with the understanding that God will open the heart of Lydia. That all those that have been ordained to eternal life, all that, that have been appointed to eternal life, believed. Okay, so it's not 
Is it a sincere offer or not? We preach the gospel to every creature under heaven. All men need to hear the gospel. All men need to be called to repentance. But it is other fallen and finite human beings, redeemed, who are out there proclaiming the gospel. So we're not, we're not God making an offer. We are speaking his word to people. But we're telling them, anyone, if you repent and believe, you will be saved. Now, who will repent and believe? The elect. And no one else. It's as simple as that. Now listen, <clears throat> obviously we don't know who the non-elect are when a pastor preaches, but my question pertains to God's perspective. And, and the, the thing that I've always thought when I, this, I first heard this debate was God's not on the streets doing evangelism. His ambassadors are out there doing it, but we're fallen, finite, redeemed people who don't know everything. So what do we do? We don't, we don't try to figure out who the elect are. We preach the gospel to everyone and tell them, you are sinful, you're under God's just condemnation, repent and believe in Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Okay, that is a true statement. Anyone who repents and believes will be saved. And the thing is, why is this even a question? I mean, do we really believe it's a sincere offer? Of course it's a sincere offer that we are making, but God's not the one out there doing it. Okay, all right. Uh, I know the term hyper-Calvinism has been used, and sometimes rightly, but I think sometimes it's unfairly applied, and he has in brackets here, Protestant Reformed Church, when it is used toward those who are trying to protect the doctrine of particular atonement and deny common grace. Yeah, hyper-Calvinism historically meant people who, who denied that we have an obligation to share the gospel with people and to tell people to repent and believe it. Okay. <clears throat> I did watch your video about common grace and agree with you that common patience is a better term since I don't believe God shows grace to the non-elect, but his providence. Yeah, exactly right. M rain, uh, um, money, food, etc. Sometimes allows them to prosper and do good, right, in a civil sense, in a civil sense there. But it is only for the benefit of the elect and not for them. Mm -hmm. Also, according to the doctrine of total depravity, God's restraint of their sin doesn't make them partially good in God's eyes, right? And he has no favor toward them in a non-saving sense. It seems to be very contentious and dividing matter in the Reformed community, so your help will be appreciated. I did get Raymond's systematic theology, and we'll be consulting it, but I wanted to hear your um, teaching first since I trust you. Okay. Uh, well, good. Good. I'm glad, I'm glad that, um, that I've been able to help, help a little bit. Um, to me, the, the categories of, of grace and mercy and things like that um, have got to be protected and reserved um, only for God's uh, genuine saving activity. Otherwise, you, you muddy the water there, and you if you mix those categories, then you're going to create problems downstream uh, in your theology. That, that will be a problem. Okay. Um, hi from the Rocky Mountains. Okay. I just want to see real quick who's here. There's Brian Thomas. And hello, all. Dane, D DFC Prop. Is that Dane? Is that Dane Crandall here? Is that Dane Crandall? And there's Stephen Falling. Hey, Stephen. There's Ryan. There's Paul Garvey. Not Paul Harvey, but Paul Garvey with the rest of the story. It is. Dane, tell, uh, tell Beck and, and Anya and Cabe and your uh, folks I said hello. Okay, let's see. Let me get to the next uh, email here. Um, uh, do, do, do. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here we go. <clears throat> I was listening to your eschatology series, which I enjoyed very much. Thank you. I had one question. You said the binding of Satan in the book of Revelation, in Revelation 20, already happened when Christ uh, with Christ on the cross, I think you said. But Revelation was written after that, so I'm wondering your thoughts. Not trying to provoke you, just thought of that today, and I can't get past it. Um, let's see. The binding of Satan already happened with Christ on the cross, I think you said. Yeah, um, the binding of, of Satan, that's actually, a, a, I did a whole lecture on, on that. And so I can't really cover everything um, in this quick question. But um, yeah, the book of Revelation was written after the, the crucifixion, obviously. Um and the binding of, of, of the devil really, I think, happens during Jesus' earthly ministry. I think that's one of the reasons there were so many demonic possessions that he um, undid and so many demons that were cast out. It was to illustrate that the principalities and powers, and that, that's what Paul was referring to when he speaks of the principalities and powers. That's the demonic hosts, demonic forces, are disarmed by the work of Christ and by the coming of Christ. And you see Jesus already plundering uh, the house of Satan by setting people free, not just from infirmity, not just from disease, and not just from uh, demonic possession, but setting them free mo much more importantly from their sins and bringing forgiveness of sins. 
And so the gospel of Jesus Christ binds the devil when it's preached, when it goes forward in, in power, um, there's nothing Satan can do to stop his house from being plundered. Um, and he's not going to be able to deceive the nations anymore. Once the gospel gains a foothold and people's lives are, are changed and people's hearts are renewed and changed and they become devoted students of the word of God, um, Satan's ability to, um, to deceive the nations um, is greatly diminished um, and his power is, is bound by the coming of the Lord Jesus. And we, that's what we've been watching uh, since the time of the Great Commission started there in, in Acts chapter 2 and, and as it pushes forward throughout all of human history. Uh, we see the strongholds of the devil being being destroyed and broken, and yeah, there's there's setbacks along the way, and there's heresy along the way, and there's things that look really terrible along the way. But Athanasius Contramundum will triumph. You know, eight in the ark there with Noah will survive. Um, the the deity of Christ will be a doctrine held by all Christian people, even though during those years of Arian ascendancy. Uh, after the time of the First Nicene Council, um, the, that creed had to fight for 60 years for survival. Uh, Athanasius Contramundum will triumph. Um, and so the devil uh, ultimately is a defeated foe. And of course, I'm post-millennial, and I've described that in other places. So I do believe that while we're certainly collapsing in the West, I think that the church is probably going to go through a period of purification, and, and it's going to go through some trials that are really going to test it. And it's also going to, it's what that will do is what trials have always done to the church. It clears out the driftwood when it becomes less popular to be a Christian, uh, the apostates and the worldlings and the people who are unconverted, they'll, they'll leave, they'll walk away. They'll go off and do their, their liberal garbage. And what's the end of that death. What's our culture drunk on now death. This culture hates kids. It likes everything that's vile and disgusting and, perverted and twisted and what what is everything that's vile disgusting perverted and twisted lead to crickets chirping over tombstones people die they have no legacy they don't have kids they don't they don't want kids they don't want anything like that they do everything that's life denying and that's why the scripture says in proverbs 8 36 wisdom speaking there says all those who hate me love death uh in psalm 34 21 evil shall slay the wicked what does man do when left to his own, when God pulls back his restraint? What does man do? He kills himself and kills everyone around him, kills everyone around him. And so that's kind of what God seems to be doing is lifting the, the restraint so that human beings will, will kill themselves, which is what we're doing as a culture. Um, not uh, murdering unborn children, um, thwarting uh, the fruit of the womb, um, not wanting children, not wanting family, not wanting a table, not wanting a house, not wanting to lead a family. You just have that going on everywhere, and um, it's just gonna it's gonna get worse, barring revival from on high. Um, but one thing that I think is really important, and I just thought of this, we had a wonderful um, conference called Ambassador Ambassadors for Christ, Ambassadors for Christ at our church, and had some wonderful speakers here. Al Baker uh, is a great evangelist, and he took a group out, went door to door, and shared the gospel with a lot of people, and. We're really trying to be, we want to be more deliberate about doing evangelism. Like, let's just grab ourselves by the seat of our pants and go talk to people. I've been going downtown. If I, I mentioned to you all in this program once, talk to a guy downtown for like two hours with one of my kids with me. Lily, Lily was with me. Talk to him for two solid hours at a bus stop about the gospel. And this guy was so confused about the gospel. He thinks we're supposed to keep the feast days and we're supposed to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. We all, you want to go to heaven, you got to still be circumcised. I'm like, wow. I never was able to really figure out what, like what all the theological influences were here. Would you believe John O'Rourke ran into the same guy <laughs> and talked to him for a long time, downtown Kingsport. I, I guess they were downtown Kingsport. And the guy, the guy mentioned me that he had talked to me. And uh, I thought that was pretty amazing. I told, I told John, God must love that guy. God must want to save him. I guess, <laughs> even though, I don't think I've ever talked to anybody uh, who's more confused about Christianity than, than that guy. Nice guy, friendly guy, um, but non-Trinitarian. You know, he, he kept saying to me, um, he kept quoting verse after verse. He had Bible, you know, there he's paging through. He's got all these things underlined in it. And it says, you know, God, the father and his son and, and, and his son, Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus, Jesus isn't God. He's the son of God. And I said, <clears throat> I said to him, um, you keep proving that Jesus is not the Father. We don't think Jesus is the Father. 
And I told him, by the way, every non-Trinitarian I've ever talked to, not one of them has ever understood the doctrine of Trinity. Never. And so I even asked him, what is your understanding of what most Christian churches believe about the doctrine of God, about the doctrine of the Trinity? And of course, he didn't know. He didn't know. So, um, okay, Dane, you're going to go out and hand out Bibles this Saturday with your church? Oh, great. Definitely nervous trying to remind myself it's not to me to say. That's right. That's right. Yeah, it is It is kind of nerve-wracking. You go, you know, even going downtown, you just try to walk up to complete strangers that look bored. That's what that's what I've always told the kids. Like, if someone is on their way somewhere, they're probably not going to stop and talk to you. But if someone's sitting down and they look bored, they're probably not going to walk off when you start talking. To them. Although one lady did tell me to go away. Um, and um, I had a, I had three of my kids with me. I had Lily, Hannah, and Malachi. And this lady, this lady saw me coming and looked up at me. She said, I do not want to have a conversation with you. I said, are you sure? I just want to tell you about the good news. I don't want to have a conversation with you. So, okay. So, walked away. I wonder if I should have just pressed it even more. But she looked, she did not look happy. Uh, she looked ticked off. So, and there, were, there was a, a, another guy sitting uh, on um, a park bench in the park. So, I went over and talked to him. And he was very friendly. He was very nice. Um, yeah. What was his name? I think his name was Jim. Um, kind of an older, an older fellow, night, really nice guy. He listened, he took a track and, um, I, I encouraged him to come to think about coming to church. I gave him an invitation to the church. So anyway, you know, if I can do that and I'm, I'm as introverted as they come and I'm shy, I, I've always, always have been, if I can do it, anybody can do it. Especially people always tell me that, you know, people th think, think that I'm scary looking. So you see me walking up to someone, you know, I'm like, <laughs> You know, I'm six one and and I weigh like two twenty five. I'm kind of a burly dude, and people people look at me and they're like, "What is this big burly looking scary dude who's bald and has a goatee or a beard? What's he want? What does he want? Why is he walking right up here to me?" Uh, so I guess if you're a little more unassuming in your in your appearance, it might be a little bit easier. But people, I have seen people look a little frightened that I'm coming towards them. So that's just one of the disadvantages if you're scary looking. Um, like me. So it <clears throat> wasn't always that way. I, you know, God decreed that I would lose my hair. So I guess if you're bald and, and burly, people are, are frightened of you. Okay. Um, my goodness. What, what was I just talking about? Uh, let's go back to my emails here. Um, oh yeah. The eschatology question. And then someone, someone sent me an email. I might have to do a whole program on, on this question here. Um, a friend uh, from another church who visits here regularly, uh, sent me an email about Doug Wilson, uh, my favorite subject, and he, he asked this question. I always appreciate your perspective and insights on potential wolves in sheep's clothing. What is your opinion of Doug Wilson and his assortment of relatives who are using reconstructionism in this way? I understand that the source of this report is a non-Christian and liberal worldview, but what advice would you give me on this issue? I would love to see the world following God's commands and law, but is this leadership trustworthy? <laughs> Now, I read this article today as I was uh, uh, getting ready to, to leave for church this morning when I was at home, pulled it up and was uh, walking around the house and was able to read it all. And, you know, there in, um, let's see. Oh, wow. I didn't even see what the caption on the picture was. The picture on this article, I'll, I'll put it in the uh, chat thing over here. I may do a whole program and respond to this because, yeah, a lot of times uh, false teachers will use uh, social causes as a hook. Um, to spread their false doctrines. Rome's been doing it for decades with abortion. Uh, in fact, I have a book by a guy named Ralph Ovidal called More Than These about how Rome has used abortion and the pro-life movement to lure people into it for decades. And it worked with people like Randall Terry, the founder of Operation Rescue. He eventually converted to Roman Catholicism. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, Mood Russ asks, Doug Wilson, trustworthy? How far can you throw Doug Wilson anyway? <laughs> uh, yeah, probably not very far. Um, anyway, there's a picture here of all these people singing. It says, members of Christ Church. Apparently, the church has got like 2,000 people in it now. During Psalm Sing in September, outside City Hall in Moscow, Idaho, church members were protesting against an order that requires people to either socially distance or wear a face mask in public. Okay, yeah, um, persecution, if persecution comes, I would want it to come for the gospel that we preach. Uh, certainly, it's it's 
tyrannical uh, to require people to wear masks in you know in public. If a if a private business wants you to wear a mask, that's one thing. We really don't even have any of that around here anymore. The only place you have to wear a mask now uh, in um, this area is if you go into a hospital. Which okay, I, I get that well, they would want to do that, but nowhere else really needs to do it. But so, so wow, there's a huge throng of people uh, all holding up their cell phones, taking videos because we, we always want to make sure we record it if we're being persecuted. Um, to protest social distancing and wearing face masks in, in public. Um, I, of all the things you could invest your time in, I, I would think that preaching Christ and crucified would be better anyway. The, the fact of the matter is everybody, uh, everybody that's a Christian uh, holds to a form of, of reconstruction. Everybody does. Meaning you think that certain things should be illegal um, and that certain things should be uh, held up as, as true. For example, um, Marriage should be protected by the magistrate as being one man and one woman for life. Um, abortion should be illegal. If you agree with that, you are a reconstructionist. So the question is not, um, are we reconstructionists? Do we think that, that society should obey the law of God? The question only is what parts of the Old Testament are still in force, should be upheld by magistrates today, and, and so on and so forth. But yeah, uh, causes like this that are not the gospel um, have been used to lure people into false teachings all the time. Uh, Rome has done it for decades with abortion. In that book, More Than These, by Ralph Ovadal, is his name, O-V-A-D-A-L, Ralph Ovadal, More Than These. And I think you can get that online somewhere. Um, it's a great book, and he goes through the papal encyclicals where popes and churchmen wrote about how to lure Protestants back to Rome using this issue of, of abortion. Uh, so false teachers use this kind of stuff all the time. And of course, Wilson, Doug Wilson has never been known uh, for the gospel because he doesn't preach the gospel. He's always been known for this other stuff, for this reconstructionist stuff and for the, um, his, <clears throat> his views of antebellum slavery, um, pre-Civil War slavery in the U.S. as, quote, a relationship based upon mutual affection and confidence. Um, and that the enslaved enjoyed a life of plenty of simple pleasures of food, clothes, and good medical care, end quote. And other other wonderful, fun stuff that, that he's known for. And, uh, yeah, we, we may do a whole program on that. I might uh, take the time to look up some stuff there. Um, I don't like talking about Doug Wilson and the Federal Vision. The only reason I've done that since I moved to this part of Northeast Tennessee is I can smell the Federal Vision in the area. It's up here. It's in Northeast Tennessee. Believe you me. Uh, there was a fella that... Uh, had been a deacon in this church um, who eats, drinks, and sleeps. Doug Wilson, blog and may blog, and Peter Lightheart, first things, and uh, Junior Sprawl, and uh, Wilkins, and N.T. Wright, and all of them just thinks they all walk on water. And Pato Communion, in fact, I even asked this guy. Um, just to get, a, cause he was, he wanted to know when I get, when I moved here, he was trying to see, am I sympathetic to the federal vision? And I, you, I, I'll give you 10 guesses how I responded to that. But I actually, before we got into what we disagreed about, which is almost everything, I asked him, how did you uh, come to know Christ? Why don't you tell me before we get into the stuff we disagree about, why don't you share your testimony with me? And he sent me a paper on how he came to believe in pedo communion. And I thought, you know, for them. That is the gospel. Pedo communion. That is the gospel. It becomes the gospel. So, uh, all right, good, good stuff. Uh, I'm going to bookmark this article and uh, hang on to this email here. I may, may do a whole program responding to that. That might be worth, worth a response. Um, but <sighs> there's a difference between, between persecution for the cause of righteousness and persecution for the cause of, of Christ and for the gospel and persecution because you're obnoxious. I'm not sure what this is. You know, maybe it is. There was a documentary, now it's all coming back, called Our Town. And it was on It was on YouTube. Let me see if I can find it real quick. I think it's still out there. And it was about Doug Wilson and Christ Church and Lagos School and New St. Andrews College, the whole thing, and how they had basically tried to take over um, this whole town. Um, let's see. Um, let me see if I can let's see if this documentary is still out here. I wonder if it still is. Um, I don't, I don't see it. Okay. Th there was a documentary called Our Town about Moscow 
and how it had been kind of infiltrated by Christ Church and, and all of the, the ruckus that had been stirred up over Doug Wilson's, you know, pro-slavery book, um, Slavery as it really was, it was called. But anyway, um, I may or may not do that. I'm not sure. Um, we'll see. Anyway, we're right at the one hour mark. And so I'm going to go ahead and, and head it off there. Yeah. Yeah. How I came to believe in Pado communion that deserves a Star Trek Spock eyebrow arch. It, it did. And uh, I've used that as an illustration for years now. I asked the guy, how did you come to know Christ? And he sends me a paper on how he came to believe in Pado communion. Nothing about the gospel in there. <laughs> I thought that's it. The, the federal vision. That is the gospel. It's all these weird things that they, that they've, that they've embraced. Those things become the gospel. So let's let the gospel be the gospel. Justification by faith alone. That's the gospel. Always has been, always will be. Paul thought that, and I, I tend to agree with him. Anyway, thank you all for watching or for listening.